Hey, 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 welcome back. Today we're gonna talk about everyone's favorite Saturday morning grandpa, or uncle, I guess, would be more appropriate. That's right, we're gonna finally dive into the sagely wisdom of Uncle Iroh and the immense spiritual knowledge that he teaches the main characters and us in the process. So sit back, grab your tsungi horn, heat up some jasmine tea, and one more thing before we get started, on the subject of wisdom, we do a live event every full moon, every month called the Wisdom Moon, and the next one is coming up soon. Use the link below to see how you can join our live event, and I hope to see you there. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the show, and don't get me started with you, I mean, it's on Netflix, Iroh is the oldest main character that we follow actively throughout the series, and is pretty much your Lao Tzu or mystical Buddha kind of guy. He was a general of the Fire Nation and one of its greatest warriors, having the title, the Dragon of the West, after laying siege to the Earth capital, but retired after his son Lu Ten was killed in action and he became disillusioned with the war effort. When we first meet him though, Iroh is introduced simply as the uncle of Zuko and acts as a father figure to him, as well as a moral compass, giving him great advice, which Zuko often ignores, and accompanies him on his hunt for the Avatar, slowly teaching him to accept his true nature and become more in balance with himself. Despite the Fire Nation origin though, he's not actually a bad guy. In fact, he's probably one of the beating moral hearts of the show, who in stark contrast to Zuko, is easygoing, friendly, and dryly good humored. Let's face it, aside from Sokka, he's probably at the top of the list for most people's favorite characters growing up. Seriously, when I'm old and gray, I wanna be just like Iroh and Gandalf and Dumbledore. Anyways, right from episode one, we see Iroh's greatest virtue and wisdom, patience. Iroh doesn't really have it easy on the show, for in the beginning, Zuko treats him really poorly, ignoring his advice and shouting at him a fair bit. Yet Iroh is there for him no matter what, as he understands the importance of family and of being there for the people who matter, undoubtedly coming from the loss of his son. As the series progresses and he gets more screen time, we start to see the real wisdom behind his actions. But season one really sets his groundwork up as embodying patience, serenity, and mindfulness. Unlike most of the Fire Nation, he's a man who sees beauty in the simplest aspects of life, treating his self-imposed exile almost like an extended vacation to see the world. As Colin McCannon points out, Iroh is a great man, sure, but what makes him truly wise and believable is his journey. He didn't start out as a mystical Buddha with life all figured out. He was broken, having lost the thing that mattered most to him, his child. The best part though, and ultimate lesson, is that Iroh let it define him in the best way. He could have become bitter and angry, but instead chose to live the remainder of his life to the fullest in an attempt to avoid the mistakes and regrets from earlier in his life. In fact, in Tales of Ba Sing Se, one of the best episodes ever, it's suggested in that section where he sings Little Soldier Boy that some of that great optimism and generosity that he's known so well for are a form of post-traumatic growth from the loss of his son. Like the waterbenders, he embraces the concept of flow and learns to move with the tides of life rather than stay stagnant and bitter. Speaking of waterbenders, this brings us to some of his best attributes that countless people have learned from. His quotes of everything. He's probably best known for his words of wisdom as he freely advises most of the characters throughout the series. One quote in particular is often brought up as one of his best. When teaching Zuko in season two about lightning bending, Iroh explains that, It is important to draw wisdom from many different places. If we take it from only one place, it becomes rigid and stale. Adhering to this philosophy is what eventually led him to develop lightning bending, a technique never before seen by studying the push and pull of water bending. Equally, he tries to convince Zuko that understanding earth bending is just as important when he's fire bending to develop a true understanding of the element, which amazingly, Zuko then carries on to Aang during his training later on. One of the best parts of season three is when we learn that Iroh lied about killing the last dragon to protect the ancient dragon masters, Ren and Shaw, and even be their student. Through his compassion, he was able to drive his firebending powers from vitality, compassion, and life force, rather than from rage as most of his contemporary firebenders did, thereby gaining a power none of them had. For us, the wisdom is essentially the same when applied to any aspect of life. If you learn about something from only one source, then you'll pick up all of the biases and influence from that source and never form your own opinion. 
But if instead you look in different places for the inherent wisdom, you'll end up being a much more whole and balanced individual. I think Iroh's wisdom here stems from his understanding of the four nations as balancers of each other. His nature and the course of his life have brought him to a philosophy that embraces peacefulness, harmony, and mutual understanding rather than conflict. But what's more, it seems like he would much rather see the four nations live in mutual peace as opposed to a single Fire Nation rule, as each one brings something unique to the table. People often compare him to a Buddha-like figure. I think that a much better comparison is Budai, the Chinese monk who is often depicted as the fat or laughing Buddha, rather than Siddhartha himself. Ironically, despite his carefree and detached attitude, he is something of a hedonist in his old age. He likes fine pleasures, fancy tea, and seems to focus his life more around relaxation and fun than he does around helping Zuko find Aang or engage in his nation's nationalistic war. In fact, he often flirts with loads of girls in the series and is called handsome a couple of times. And he loves it. Maybe he watched our recent episode on materialism and took it to heart. Or perhaps more likely, maybe it's a natural result of his earlier years conquesting. His soul has been liberated from war and now all he wants to be is jolly. Ironically though, despite his focus on pleasure and relaxation, he does remark that the best tea tastes delicious, whether it comes in a porcelain pot or a tin cup, implying that it's what's nurtured inside that truly matters. But he does also accidentally poison himself with a flower in that other episode too. So eh, you win some, you lose some. The point is like the kids of Avatar, he doesn't take himself too seriously and takes the time to have moments of quiet in the face of a decision. Now, I was kind of joking before about him being like a big kid, but the more you look at him, he really kind of is. And it's great. While many of the series' other major characters were maturing throughout the course of the show, and of course there's the 14-year-old warlord to boot, Iroh was already a changed man who already suffered tremendous loss and matured through it, reminding us that failure is simply a chance to start over anew, this time only wiser. Even when opening his tea shop, he points out that there's nothing wrong with a life of peace and prosperity, advising Zuko to abandon his quest for honor. But even then, he never forces him because he knows that it has to be Zuko's decision to understand that on his own. Speaking of starting things, remember earlier how we explained that Iroh liked to draw wisdom from all of the elements rather than just fire? A couple of fans have pointed out that his attitude towards tea is the perfect example of this. While Iroh's love of tea is often played for laughs, there's an underlying meaning and purpose and to some extent lesson behind his love for jasmine and ginseng tea that's not often talked about. In order to make an absolutely outstanding cup of tea, all four of the bending elements are required. You need clay for the teapots and cups and the leaves as well the water for the substance, fire to heat up the tea, and the air to blow on the hot tea to cool it so that you can drink it. And even if you leave it out to cool naturally, it would either get cold or be oversteeped. If you take just one element out, the tea is either impossible to make or worse without it. Iroh knew this just as he knew that the only way to defeat the Fire Nation was for all four elements to work together. Iroh learned several things by watching other bending tribes. He knew that understanding others was the only way to be whole. Tea then is a perfect manifestation of these teachings. On the surface, Iroh's love of tea could be viewed as nothing more than a simple character trait, but it also serves as a representation of his spirituality and calming nature. In the context of achieving harmony and balance among the four nations, it's a lesson on the value of tolerance, balance, and listening that Uncle Iroh passed on to Zuko. And while this theory is kind of just Reddit headcanon, it's a deep and meaningful way to look at Iroh's love of tea in a new light. He didn't enjoy any old cup, only one that was truly and fully balanced with all of the elements working together in unison. But the beautiful thing about Iroh is that as much as we can talk about and praise him for his peace and his jolly good nature, is that he also, much like Gandalf and Dumbledore, can stand for the intensity of the fiery element and knows exactly how and when to use it. He does this both with his wisdom as well as with his firebending. One example of this is when he yells at Zuko under Lake Laogai. I know my own destiny, uncle. Is it your own destiny? Or is it a destiny someone else has tried to force on you? And that's just when he's delivering compassionate wisdom with intensity. He also liberates all of Ba Sing Se at the very end of the series after a getting ripped in jail montage and shows exactly why they call him the Dragon of the West. 
All in all, Iroh's philosophy of flow is undoubtedly inspired by Taoist values and really helps to bring profound spiritual wisdom to a younger audience. And if you haven't seen it yet, I would recommend wholeheartedly going and watching this whole series, even just for him alone. We could have written this entire video made up of just his quotes and it would have been as equally great. So I think Iroh really is a modern day ascended master. Even his bending forms are influenced by Southern Shaolin, dragon and form intention styles of Kung Fu, all of which match his personality pretty well. Interestingly, Casey Farrell pointed out in reviews that after the season two episode of Legend of Korra, where Iroh appeared to her in the spirit world, Korra actually became a much more likable character with the fans because she took Iroh's wisdom on board. Even in death, he's bringing the fandom together. So with that, thank you so much for watching. We'll leave a link to some of Iroh's best quotes and snippets of wisdom below so that you can check them out. But otherwise, totally go and watch Airbender because there's so much hidden wisdom inside of it. And just please always remember, above all else, that being sick of tea is like being sick of breathing. Toodles.